just about everybody has heard of the Boston Tea Party, however Beantown was not the only colonial city that held a popular protest against British tea in the years leading up to the American Revolution. Other cities such as Charleston, South Carolina, also held tea protests that are now almost forgotten, that involved the seizure and dumping of tea into the water. Following are 20 things about those and other lesser-known history facts from colonial America. The Beef Behind the Boston Tea Party The Boston Tea Party is one of the most iconic events in American history. Its genesis lay in the 1767 Townsend Acts, in which Parliament taxed various imports into the American colonies. The imminent colonial protests and massive noncompliance led to the taxes repeal in 1770, except for those on tea, retained to demonstrate Parliament's right to raise colonial revenues without colonial consent. American merchants resorted to widespread smuggling of untaxed tea, until Parliament passed a Tea Act in 1773, intended to both help the financially troubled British East India Company, and stick it to smugglers. The company was granted a tea monopoly, and although it paid import duties, it received tax breaks that allowed it to undersell everybody with prices lower than even smuggled untaxed tea. Tea was carried exclusively on East India Company ships and sold through its agents, which cut out colonial shippers and merchants. That drove normally conservative American businessmen to ally with colonial radicals such as Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty. In cities such as Philadelphia, New York and Charleston, tea agents resigned or cancelled orders, merchants refused to accept consignments, and dock workers refused to unload tea. Ships laden with tea were thus often forced to return to England with their cargo. Boston's royal governor however convinced tea consignees, two of them his sons, to conduct business as usual. Adamant that the law be upheld, he insisted that tea ships dock, unload their cargo and pay the appropriate duties. The Bostonians' reaction was memorable. The Boston Tea Party was not the only colonial tea protest. British law required ships that arrived in colonial ports to unload and pay import duties within 20 days or have their cargo confiscated. The East India Company tea ship Dartmouth arrived in Boston in late November 1773 and a mass meeting passed a resolution that urged its captain to return to England with his cargo. However, Governor Thomas Hutchinson refused to allow the tea to be returned to Britain and shortly thereafter, two more tea ships, the Beaver and Eleanor arrived, December 16, 1773, was the last day of the Dartmouth's deadline. That night about 60 men in blankets and Indian headdress, encouraged by a large crowd of Bostonians, boarded the ships and dumped the tea, valued at 18,000 pounds into the harbour. Parliament retaliated with punitive measures known as the Intolerable Acts, that shut off Boston's trade until the destroyed tea was paid for, the attempt to single out Massachusetts for punishment backfired, served to unite the colonies, and sped up the drift toward war. Boston was not the only American city to hold tea protests. Other colonial cities got in on the act, too. Charleston, for example, hosted two tea parties, and the first one took place before Boston's. However, as seen below, the Charleston protests lacked the panache that made Beantown's tea party so iconic, and so are largely forgotten. The Charleston Tea Parties Two weeks before the better-known Boston Tea Party, Charleston, South Carolina, held its own act of civil disobedience protest against tea import duties, as in Boston tea arrived in East India Company ships, and people were adamant that it not be unloaded in their port. On December 3, 1773, in what came to be known as the first Charleston Tea Party, the locals seized 200 tea chests. They lacked the Bostonians' pizzazz, however, and did not don costumes and dump it in the harbor, but simply confiscated and warehoused it without paying import duties, that was perhaps more pragmatic, but it did not make for great propaganda. That explains why the Boston Tea Party is known to this day, while all relatively few have heard of Charleston's. The second Charleston Tea Party occurred nearly a year later, in early November 1774, the ship Britannia docked in the city's harbor, with seven chests of East India Company tea in its hold, its captain admitted that he had the mischievous drug aboard his ship, but swore that it had been loaded without his knowledge or consent. He was thus spared punishment by the angry locals. However, the three merchants who had ordered the tea were forced to walk to Charleston's harbor on November 3, 1774, and personally dump the tea chests overboard into the water. The pilgrims ended up in Massachusetts because they ran out of beer.
there are not that many things that can put a damper on festivities, or ruin a party and harsh up the attendees' buzz more quickly than if the hosts manage to run out of beer, it is a bummer, but seldom does the lack of beer produce results as consequential as what occurred in the summer of 1620, when the pilgrims ended up in Massachusetts, because they were about to run out of beer. Today that might strike us as a trivial reason for such a momentous decision, but that's because we're not colonial pilgrims. For the pilgrims aboard the Mayflower back then, beer was a serious matter, it began on August 5, 1620, when they departed Plymouth, England, for a journey across the Atlantic to the newly established Virginia colony. In other words when they set out, the pilgrims' destination had not been Massachusetts, but a point significantly further south. The vagaries of weather, the hardships of crossing an ocean in a 17th century sail ship, coupled with low levels of beer, made them change their minds about where to settle. The Virginia Pilgrims The Pilgrims were the core of a congregation of about 400 English Protestants, who splintered from the Puritans and decided to live in exile in Leiden, Holland, unhappy with the Church of England, and what they viewed as its departure from the true path, they chose to live as separatists in exile rather than do what other Puritans did, and stay in England to try and reform its church from within. Life in Holland eventually grew too onerous, so they decided to sail to the New World. There, on the far side of the Atlantic, the pilgrims hoped to establish a colonial religious theocracy, where they could live in accordance with the tenets of their faith. Eventually they landed and settled in Plymouth, about 40 miles south of modern Boston, at roughly latitude 42 degrees north. However, that had not been their intended destination. When they set sail, the pilgrims had planned to arrive in the Virginia colony hundreds of miles from Plymouth at about latitude 40 degrees north. The unfortunately named Speedwell was neither speedy nor well. The pilgrims' intended journey to the New World was beset by many delays. They had planned to sail from England in July of 1620. However, most of the people who planned to make the voyage lived in Leiden, Holland, at the time. So the plan was for a sister ship, the Speedwell to sail from England to the Netherlands, pick up the passengers, return to Southampton, join the Mayflower and then the two ships would sail together in convoy to Virginia, the Mayflower and the Speedwell sailed from England to the New World on August 5, 1620. However the Mayflower's sister ship proved unfortunately named, in that she was neither speedy nor well. The Speedwell began to leak, so the pilgrims docked in Dartmouth for repairs, they set out again on August 21, but after a few days at sea, the Speedwell began to leak once again. The voyage's leaders came to the conclusion, that the Speedwell was simply not up to the task of crossing the Atlantic, so they decided to leave her in England, and continue to the New World in the Mayflower. After supplies were transferred from the Speedwell, the Mayflower finally set out on September 6 over a month behind schedule. It would prove to be an arduous voyage. Bad weather blew the pilgrims away from their intended colonial destination. Today passenger planes can whisk us across the Atlantic from England to the United in just a few hours. Back in the 17th century, However to cross the Atlantic was an often treacherous endeavor whose duration was measured in weeks, if not in months. For the pilgrims, once they had ditched the leaky speedwell, and set out together aboard the Mayflower, the voyage began smoothly at first. However the ship was beset by foul weather, and fouler storms in the second half of the trip. Sixty-six days after they had left England a voyage that they had hoped would take a month, they finally spotted land at today's Cape Cod on November 9, 1620, that was about 250 farther north than their original destination in colonial Virginia. All else being equal, they would have simply sailed down the coast until they reached their intended settlement site. However, all else was not equal, and the pilgrims faced a serious problem. They were out of beer. Back then that was a serious problem. If all had gone according to plan, we might have had the Manhattan pilgrims. In the 17th century and indeed, Throughout the age of sail drinking water aboard ship was liable to go bad, especially on long voyages, sea voyagers such as the Mayflower's pilgrims relied on beer, as a source of hydration that would not spoil. So to run out of the brewed stuff was a big deal. The pilgrims' initial destination had been a Virginia colony island that teemed with wildlife and natural resources, fronted by a huge and navigable natural harbor, and bordered by a navigable river that led deep into the interior. Back then, the Virginia colony's borders were not the same as those of today's Virginia. In 1620, the northern boundary was about 225 miles farther north than Virginia's current border, 
and the island where the voyagers had intended to settle is today called Manhattan. Instead the lack of beer led the pilgrims to explore the coastline of Cape Cod, and the mainland nearby, until they finally decided upon a site. On Christmas Day December 25, 1620, the pilgrims founded Plymouth Plantation as their new colonial settlement, and as the site where they would brew up a fresh batch of beer. Colonial America's Notorious Witch Hunt Other than the American Revolution whose success ended America's colonial status, perhaps no event in colonial American history is as famous, or infamous as the Salem Witch Trials, they are also probably history's best-known case of mass hysteria. The witch craze of 1692 to 1693 took place against a cultural and religious background that was predisposed to believe in the supernatural. Witchcraft might be laughable to most today. In 17th century colonial America however, and especially in Salem and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, it was taken quite seriously. The belief that the devil could grant witches extraordinary powers in return for their loyalty, and that witchcraft could be used to inflict harm on the good and godly, was taken for granted, witch hunts had swept through the Christian world starting in the 15th century, and hit a peak of intensity in the 16th century, and into the 17th. By the second half of the 17th century, witch trials had begun to wane across much of Europe. They continued however in the fringes of Europe and in the American colonies. The Start of a Mass Hysteria The Salem witch craze began in January 1692, when the nine-year-old daughter and eleven-year-old niece of Reverend Samuel Paris began to have screaming fits, as they screeched, the girls contorted themselves into unnatural positions, threw things, and made weird noises. They also complained that they felt skin pains, as if they were being pricked with pins. A local doctor found no signs of a physical ailment to explain the fits, and blamed them on the supernatural soon another young girl, aged eleven, began to exhibit similar symptoms. Before long in Amy to Rush, other young women in the colonial village began to complain of similar pains and exhibit similar behavior. When they were examined by magistrates the first three girls accused three local women of having bewitched them, the culprits were the reverend's black slave, Tatuba an elderly impoverished woman named Sarah Osborne, and a homeless beggar named Sarah Good. Osborne and Good protested their innocence but for whatever reason, perhaps torture or perhaps a promise of leniency, Tatuba confessed that she had been visited by the devil, whom she described as a black man who asked her to sign a book. She admitted that she had signed, then went on to point the finger at other witches. The Salem Witch Craze's First Victim Tatuba's confession that she was a witch, and her accusation of other women as being witches as well, led to mass hysteria throughout the Salem region and colonial Massachusetts, over the following months, a flood of accusations poured in, and the more far-fetched they were, the more they solidified the populace's belief in the potency of witchcraft, and enhanced the panic. When the godly and regular churchgoer Martha Corey was accused of witchcraft, the accusation did not give the good people of Salem pause. Instead, it merely redoubled their fears if solid citizen Martha Corey could be a witch, then anybody could be a witch. On May 27, 1692, the colony's governor ordered that a special court be established to try the accused. Its first victim was Bridget Bishop, an unpopular older woman known as a gossip, and who had a reputation for promiscuity. She protested her innocence, but it did her no good. She was convicted, sentenced to death, and hanged on June 10th in what became known as Gallows Hill. Five more were convicted and hanged in July, another five in August, and eight more that September a colonial hysteria that became a cautionary tale for the ages. The Salem witch trials were marked by a lack of due process, and the use of what was known as spectral evidence, basically, testimony by witnesses that they dreamt or had a vision in which the spirit, or specter of the accused which did them harm. It meant that an accuser's dream or vision that Jane Doe bit, hit, and punched me, was admissible evidence in court that Jane Doe had actually bit, hit, and punched the accuser. It did not matter if the unfortunate Doe was nowhere near the accuser that day, or specter was. Respected theologian and Reverend Cotton Mather wrote the court to caution against the use of spectral evidence, but he was ignored. Massachusetts colonial governor finally put an end to the trials, and their ever-expanding reach when his own wife was accused of being a witch. By then 200 people had been accused of witchcraft, and 20 had already been hanged. Eventually, the authorities admitted that the trials had been a mistake, and compensated the families of the wrongly convicted victims of the witch hunt, 
thereafter the Salem mass hysteria and resultant trials, became synonymous with paranoia and injustice. They stand today as a cautionary tale about the dangers of religious extremism, false accusations, and the lack of due process. The Boston Tea Party was not the first time New Englanders defied the king. In the 1640s a dispute that had simmered for years between King Charles I and Parliament finally erupted into open warfare to determine once, and for all whether the monarch or legislature was supreme, Puritans were a key parliamentarian constituency, and Puritans happened to be particularly thick in the ground in colonial New England back then. So in 1644 Colonel Thomas Rainsborough sailed across the Atlantic with a regiment of New Englanders to fight against King Charles. A century and a half before the American Revolution, the Americans proved radical by contemporary standards. In an augury of future events, in the midst of the fight between King and Parliament, the colonial Americans pushed for universal male suffrage three centuries before it was actually granted in England, as Rainsborough put it, I think that the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he, and therefore truly, sir I think it's clear that every man that is to live under a government ought first by his own consent to put himself under that government. The last battle of the English Civil War was not fought in England, but in colonial America. By the 1650s, Parliament had won the English Civil War, King Charles I had been captured, tried, convicted, and beheaded, his heir had fled to the continent, and England was ruled by a Lord Protector, the Puritan Oliver Cromwell. Small-scale fighting still flared up every now and then between royalists and parliamentarians, and one such flare-up, which came to be known as the Battle of the Severn, took place on American soil in Annapolis, Maryland on March 25, 1655. It came about when Maryland's governor, sworn to the colony's royalist Catholic Lord Baltimore, sailed with a small militia to the Puritan settlement of Providence, today's Annapolis, he sought to surprise the Puritans and compel them to swear allegiance to Lord Baltimore. Instead the Puritans surprised and routed the governor's force, with a sudden attack from the rear. By the time it was over, the governor's militia had lost 49 men, while the Puritans lost only two. The engagement holds the distinction of being the last battle fought in the English Civil War, from colonial high society to notorious pirate. There was little in the background or life of colonial American William Kidd to indicate that he would someday die on the gallows, executed as one of the era's most notorious pirates, better known to history as Captain Kidd. He had been one of New York City's leading citizens, and a friend of at least three of the colony's governors. A philanthropist, he was known for his engagement in civic activities, and had played a prominent role in building the city's now historic Trinity Church, Born in Greenock, Scotland, Kidd settled in New York City as a young man. His first command at sea was as captain of a privateer ship, the Blessed William with a commission in 1689 from the governor of Nevis. He was granted letters of marque that authorized him to prey on French vessels, for the duration of hostilities between Britain and France. Later he was issued additional letters of marque by the governors of New York and the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The inauspicious start of the adventure galley's journey, in 1695, William Kidd's mission was expanded when he was presented, with a letter of marque signed by King William III, that gave him a commission to hunt pirates in the Indian Ocean, the voyage started inauspiciously. As he sailed out of London in a newly equipped ship, the 34-gun and 150-man crew adventure galley, Kidd offended a Royal Navy captain when he failed to salute his warship in the Thames. In retaliation for the perceived disrespect from a mere colonial, the captain stopped the adventure galley and seized half of its crew to press them into the Royal Navy. Kidd was left to cross the Atlantic shorthanded. He eventually made it to New York, where he replenished his crew with whichever unemployed seafarers he could find. Unfortunately for Kidd, most of the new crew turned out to be hardened criminals and former pirates. The ship was struck with illness en route, and by the time he reached the Comoro Islands in the Indian Ocean, a third of Kidd's crew had died of cholera, worse he was unable to find the pirates he had been sent to hunt down. The enterprise seemed a failure, and the crew grew antsy. So they urged him to attack some vessels that sailed by in order to make the voyage worth their time. When Kidd declined, his men threatened mutiny. Under pressure and also to recoup his investment, he gave in, and reluctantly began to attack ships not covered by his commission as a privateer. William Kidd left Colonial America as a highly respected member of society, and returned a notorious outlaw. By 1698, 
William Kidd had abandoned reluctance and any pretense that he was a lawful privateer and turned full pirate a year. He sealed his fate when he attacked a British East India Company ship. The powerful company exerted its influence in London, and Kidd was declared an outlaw of the sea. Unbeknownst to him, by the time he returned to the American colonies, his public image had been transformed from a member of high society and into that of an infamous pirate, the notorious Captain Kidd. Attitudes towards piracy had changed from the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that had prevailed when he began his voyage. Now, crackdown was in the air and the powers that be were eager to make an example of somebody. The colonial authorities arrested Kidd as soon as he arrived in Boston, and sent him in chains across the Atlantic for prosecution in London. There, word of his previous connections with government elites caused a scandal, and the powerful supporters whom he had expected to defend him abandoned him in droves. He was swiftly tried and convicted, and on May 23, 1701 was hanged, after which his body was gibbeted and left to rot in a cage on the Thames for all to see. The maid who conned colonial America by impersonating a princess. Until well into the 19th century, Britain routinely got rid of convicted criminals via penal transportation, a system whereby undesirables were shipped to faraway colonies. An alternative sentence for felonies, transportation was usually imposed for offenses for which the death penalty was deemed too severe. Upon arrival at their destination, the convicts were sold into indentured servitude for a fixed term. The prisoners were free once their sentence term was over but in practice, lack of funds usually meant that they were stuck where they had been transported, unable to return to Britain. To British authorities, the fact that the transported convicts were unable to return was not an unfortunate bug in the program, but a prominent and desirable feature. In the 18th century, Britain's American colonies and the West Indies were the most popular dumping grounds for such undesirables. That is how Sarah Wilson, circa 1754 to circa 1865, arrived in colonial Baltimore in 1771. Sarah had exhibited a knack for the con from early on. As a teenager she had roamed England, and took advantage of the credulity and compassion of people. A commoner who could impersonate an aristocrat. Sarah Wilson had a gift for impersonation, although born into the lowest class, she was able to act as if she was a member of upper society. In 1767 a newspaper report about her read, It seems this woman has, for some time past, been traveling through almost all parts of the kingdom, assuming various titles and characters, at different times and places, she has presented herself to be of high birth and distinction, as well foreign in English, and accordingly styling herself a Princess of Mecklenburg, Countess of Normandy, Lady Countess Wilbraham and under some or other of such names making promises of providing, by means of her weight and interest, for the families of the lower class of people. Unto those of higher rank in life she has represented herself to be in the greatest distress, abandoned and deserted by her parents and friends of considerable family, either upon account of an unfortunate love affair, or of religion, pretending to be a Protestant against the will of her relations, who were Roman Catholics, and always varying the account of herself as she chanced to pick up intelligence of characters, and connections of those she intended to deceive, and impose upon she is a short woman, slender made of a pale complexion, something deformed has a speck or knell over one eye. From Queen's Maid, to Queen's Sister at some point Sarah Wilson got herself a job in Buckingham Palace, as a maid to one of Queen Charlotte's ladies-in-waiting, she had light fingers, however, and was fired after she stole some of the Queen's jewels and gowns. She was also arrested, tried, convicted, and sentenced to hang. Theft was one of the hundreds of crimes punishable by death in Britain back then. Luckily her sentence was commuted to penal transportation to colonial America. Upon arrival in Baltimore, Sarah was taken off the convict ship and sold as an indentured servant, but escaped within a few days. She had managed to hang on to some of Her Majesty's belongings, and clad in the Queen's dress, she claimed to be Queen Charlotte's sister, Princess Susanna Caroline Matilda of Mecklenburg Sturlitz. To explain her presence in the American colonies, she invented a royal family quarrel, and a scandal that required her to temporarily leave Britain, until things calmed down. During her time as a maid in Buckingham Palace, Sarah had observed royal mannerisms and aristocratic etiquette. As seen below, she managed to convince many colonial Americans that she really was a princess and parlayed that into a life of luxury.